Hi, my name is Lindy Jung. I am a science fiction and fantasy writer and YouTuber, and I make videos on this channel about books, writing, travel, and whatever else I feel like. And today, what I feel like talking about is fantasy world building. I've been working on the scripts for this video or series of videos for a while now, and it's something that I've been thinking a lot about as I progress more into sort of a type of fantasy writing that focuses more heavily on world building. While I'm always going to be a character first writer, world building has just been really fascinating to me lately and I've been reading a lot of like heavier epic fantasy books that really hone in on that and just appreciating the craft that goes into world building. That's something I've been learning a lot about lately and it's something I've been thinking about and noticing and lo and behold um, a couple weeks ago or like last week a tweet popped off of that old map of like JK Rowling's, God, I do not even want to invoke her name, but honestly, this is slander. So, so JK Rowling's wizarding world, like the entire globe, it's that one map that charts out all the different magic schools that different countries would go to. It's just absolutely a disaster and I'm obsessed with it and I can't stop thinking about it. I won't dwell on this one map in particular because, you know, why I don't even want to like put her name in my mouth any more than I have to. But just looking at this thing, like how does the entire, <laughs> let me let me pull it up one more time. In her defense, this is like, I think a fan-made map based off of incomplete blog posts and conjecture about her world. But honestly, if this is all the information they could gather, then it sounds like she just hasn't really thought about her world that much. Anyway, as you can tell, it's super Eurocentric to start with. Europe has a really high concentration of magic schools for no reason that I know of that's stated in the universe. There's nothing about Europe being like the center of magic for some reason, or at least the center of public magic education. And then as you can see, we get into even more logistical problems, like considering the fact that this takes place or this universe is built on the structure of our universe with our real world history. I mean, she catches a ton of shit for this map, but I just wanted to just point out some of my favorites. So I'm Korean, North and South Korea may or may not go to the same magic school as Japanese students in Japan. Korea was very famously colonized by Japan in the early 20th century. So I feel like that would cause some issues. Also, they do not speak the same language. Also, North Korea, just in general. And then we get into all of like non-Northern Africa is at one school. The number of languages and cultures, just like that is such a large continent. I believe it's not directly stated here, but all of South America and much of Central America as well. Yeah, all of Central America all go to a school in Brazil where they speak Portuguese when most of these countries primarily speak Spanish. Mexico also ends up going to the same school as, is that Cuba? Cuban students go into US schools. Oh boy. And then of course we have all of India and all of China. I'll go to school number 10, which doesn't even have a name. Right now, that's probably like 2 billion people just with those two countries. I wouldn't even consider myself particularly well-schooled in global politics or geography and come on, like this is nonsense. Yeah, I won't even touch on like Central and Eastern Europe and all of those conflicts there. So my point here is that this was not very well thought out. And that is the frustration with world building. If you do not think it through and you just sort of slap things onto a map and you don't consider things beyond just the shape of countries, if you don't consider language, culture, history, people, and just a whole bunch of other factors, your world building will fall flat. It is more than just a map. That's what I'm trying to get across here. That's going to be like the theme of these videos. And it's a really big topic with a lot of factors to consider. And not all of these topics or factors may apply to your particular world building, depending on the story you're going to write. That's another thing that I really, really want to like get through to people is that you can world build all day and it is so much fun. I've been having a really good time with it personally. The thing is that not every detail that I come up with is going to end up on the page. I have to start thinking about you know, which of these things are sort of extraneous? Which things are unnecessary? What details do I not have to spend an hour focusing on or two hours or days or weeks or months? Like, do I really need to build a conlang for every specific linguistic group in this country? Do I just have to like come up with a few phrases or words? Do I 
really need to even come up with that at all if it's not going to be super relevant to the story. But before we get into all of that, finally getting to the point of this video, today we're just going to talk about world building 101 or the absolute basics of world building and how to get started, what to consider at the very beginning, and the big broad strokes things that you really need to think about going into this. Without further ado, let's go ahead and dive right into it. Topic number one is why do you need world building? There's no one hard answer. I just came up with a couple of different things to consider here. One is definitely internal logic of the story. You don't want people to get tangled up in the details. You want things to make sense in your fantasy world, especially if you're building a fantasy world from scratch. And honestly, if you're writing a contemporary fantasy as well, I find that when I read contemporary fantasy, I have less of a suspension of disbelief. Like I end up looking for logical fallacies in regards to our world, connecting with this magical world or this other magical element within this world. You have to sort of justify the fantasy elements presence a lot more. So that would be when world building would come into play. Another thing is reader immersion and interest. A lot of fantasy readers actually look for books that really focus on world building and really have a richly crafted and satisfying world, there's that sense of exploration, of discovering something new that is really fulfilling to a lot of people, myself included. And a lot of the fantasy works that have lasted, have been sort of timeless, have been ones that have this sort of like large world to explore, lots of details to pick out. It's like going on a trip with your favorite author. Another thing to consider here is that world building and the details involved in it are ultimately what will set your world apart and what will make your fantasy book unique. It's also what is going to make it fantasy. The speculative elements of fantasy are usually found in world building or almost entirely found in world building. Also circling back to the idea of contemporary fantasy world building mattering, you want to think about the implications of the presence of these magical elements. Speculative fiction is about the speculation. So for example, if your world is like ours but people can use magic to turn into birds or something like that, you just want to think about the implications there. Like, how would that change history, wars, transportation, how people communicate? Do some people not have this bird magic? Do some people have it worse off, like they turn into hummingbirds when other people are hawks? Are people categorized in different ways because of it? There's so many different trains of thought you can go down and that is what's going to make your world interesting. And that's also going to make the reader feel like their questions are being answered. Another point here is that it's actually really fun and satisfying, I think. And one of the main points of really good fantasy is to explore real world issues, etc., through this sort of like different world or alternate world lens. And at the end of the day, like I said, fantasy and speculative fiction always yield some degree of world building. There's always going to be something that you have to think about and construct upon to create your world, to make it fantasy, to make it spec fic. And that's really fun. And you can do as much or as little as you want. It can be as tiny as just like altering a single event in history. Alt history sci-fi is always really cool. Or creating a whole new world from scratch. I'm going to be focusing more on the latter because that's what's fun for me, but any amount of world building can be satisfying and can enrich your story in the ways that you want it to. You just have to sort of figure out where that is and how to draw the line between too much and too little. All right, now that we've covered why world building can be important or helpful or even just fun for your story, let's go ahead and talk a little bit more about building worlds. So just to kind of like lay a base here, I want to talk about the different types of worlds. And thank you, Tolkien, for this, but there's pretty much two different types of world, primary worlds and secondary worlds. Primary world is typically what you would refer to as like our contemporary fantasies, our urban fantasies. These are built upon or set in our world or some version of it. Usually there's a handful of magical elements or perhaps a whole secondary underworld, just something to make it our world but different. The characters will probably have lives that are very similar to our own, but you know, maybe their job is interesting. They're like a goblin hunter in New York or something like that. The second example here is secondary world fantasy, which is the more common term. I see primary world thrown around a lot less than this. So these would be our classics, especially our Tolkien-esque worlds. They are entirely new, completely invented, no similarities to our world except for, of course, what inspiration the author drew from our world, which is usually the case. There's usually some sort of basis that the author is drawing from to inspire or inform this world. But in terms of the geographic features, the cities, the history, that should be more or less completely from scratch. Levels of magic present may vary. I feel like in primary world fantasy, usually there is a magical component. But if you think about things like Game of Thrones, the magic is less critical to the world than you might think. And there's a lot of fantasy that is 
like that. Obviously, both of these have their own pros and cons, and whichever one you pick or play around with will offer unique challenges and rewards. I personally have written stories in both of these settings, and I really like primary world fantasy, but I find that there are a lot more limitations. Like, you do have to consider the logic and the implications so much more. And then secondary world is a lot more labor intensive at the start, but then it can be fun. You can just sort of make up your own rules as you go. One thing I really love about secondary world fantasy is coming up with your own history. You can do that in primary world fantasy, but you're sort of like limited to how much magic you start off with. There's just different things to think about. That's all I want to say. All right, so moving into the third part of this, I want to talk a little bit about how to pick a world. Now that we've established the two base types and we know from there automatically there's going to be different subgenres of world, branching off of those. For example, urban fantasy, contemporary fantasy. Contemporary fantasy can be urban fantasy and urban fantasy is always contemporary fantasy, but contemporary fantasy is not always urban fantasy. Did that make sense? Anyway, from that base, once you've more or less figured out if you want to set your fantasy book in a version of our world or in a completely new world, I find it fun to figure out what genre or subgenre you're working with. Say you're writing a fantasy book that's also a weird western, then obviously you're gonna want to start with like a western, wild west sort of base for your world. And that'll be most likely desert, boom towns, maybe it can be historical fantasy, maybe it's not set in our world at all, it's just like a fantasy version of the wild west. If you're doing something more horror fantasy-ish, you can go with like spooky cave systems or spooky forest, whatever spooks you the most, or maybe like mansions or haunted castles, that sort of thing. Now if you're more about theme, plot, and characters as opposed to genres and subgenres, then one way to pick your world is to also consider the theme of your story. For example, if you're writing about the consequences of war, then obviously you're gonna want to pick some sort of like war-torn land and build from there and consider the history and impact that war has had on this country or this world. Another thing to consider here is scale. How big of a scale of your story taking place on? Do you have multiple points of view going on? Do you have multiple cities, continents, countries, um, dimensions even? This is important because you're gonna have to think about whether you need to maybe just get a really detailed look at a singular city in this greater world and sort of blur the edges a little bit more and the rest of it, or really flesh out multiple countries, their interactions with each other, uh, travel, history, wars, like all of that stuff. It's important here to sort of think before you leap and consider what is necessary to get your point across. I know I'm sort of repeating myself on that point a lot, but I just want to hammer it in because it is super easy to get carried away with fantasy world building. Last point here is consider your inspiration. It is great to write things that are outside of the typical sort of, uh, let's say like 14th to 16th century medieval European setting, Western medieval European setting, even more than that, British medieval European setting. I don't really know that much about European history, but, but you wanna be super careful and respectful and consider what sources you're borrowing from and if that is okay. You don't wanna end up culturally appropriating because you thought, you know, like feudal Japan would be a cool setting to write a fantasy book in and then you end up using the wrong Japanese words for things and kind of looking like a, a tool, you know? Personally, I think it's fine and even a little bit cool to see fantasy that borrows like structures, etc., from different cultures. Like if you took the feudal element of that time period in Japan and inserted it into a culture that was maybe a little bit more like appropriate to you and you sort of made those elements work and made it into their own thing, I think that's totally okay. I just think there's something a lot weirder and a little bit wrong about trying to write a direct one-to-one -one analog of fantasy Japan into your fantasy book when you're not Japanese and have no relationship with that culture beyond your passing interest for a fantasy book. I won't get into that. It's something that I just talk about a lot and that people get mad at me for. I don't know, you know, your mileage may vary. And at the end of the day, you just want to do what feels right and isn't harmful or hurtful to other people. All right, part four, how to build a world. Number one here is to figure out your best starting point. This might seem a little bit not correct, but honestly, I'll write a chapter or two before I really get into fantasy world building. I kind of want to figure out the story I want to tell before I really get into like the map making and the conlangs and all that. I want to know what characters I have, what point of view I'm focusing on, what the story's going to be. And the best way for me to figure that out is to have a sort of decent outline and then write a little bit. From there, I can figure out what my central location is going to be. Am I going to be writing from a specific city, ecosystem, country? Am I going to be thinking 
about a bigger map, a larger scale, because there's multiple points of view or just a character who travels from place to place. From there, I'm going to end up making a map and there's a couple of different tools for this. I like making one of those auto generator maps and then tinkering with it and then drawing a map by hand that suits me better. I'm going to have another video that talks specifically about constructing geography, don't worry. I usually find that it's best to sort of start with a large scale and then fill in the details as you go, but your mileage may vary again, just sort of do what feels right and do what you want to do. The reason I start by writing first is because I want to consider how my story is going to dictate how much of the world I am going to build. Again, hopefully for the last time, once you start it is super easy to get carried away and waste your time. That's another reason I start on the story first because otherwise I'm going to drive myself nuts just drawing little maps all day and scribbling out details and constructing languages and fiddling over everything and the story will die before it even begins. You don't want to do that, you want to write your book, especially if you end up working a lot and putting a lot of time and love into building your world. You want that story to get out in the world. So know your priorities, remember that a book is the book. The book is the book, the story is the book, not so much the world. Here, you don't really need to build the entire globe, you just need to build the part of the world that matters to the story. Number five is how to write a world. Like it or not, you're gonna end up leaving some pieces of your beautiful world building on the cutting room floor, and that is because the story has to be about the story. It can't be a travel guide of the seven different port cities that you made up, it can't be just a bunch of maps taped together. If you're writing a book, it has to be a book. And of course, stories are, generally speaking, about characters. So you're gonna wanna consider how your characters see this world. Your readers and ultimately you yourself will be exploring through the character's eyes and ears and noses and mouths. So consider what senses sort of jump out to them or what sensory things jump out to them. Consider what details they might notice and how that might tie into their characterization. For example, if someone is really passionate about birds, thinking a lot about birds lately, then they might create descriptive imagery that's relevant to birds, or they might notice the types of birds flying around. All these things will jump out to them. These are the details you'll probably have to come up with. Also consider what aspects of the world you built are most relevant to them. Um, do they go to the same building or district every day? Do they spend most of their time more in the slums or in like the richer part of the city? Or not city, maybe they're out in the jungle running around jumping between trees. Oh my god, I missed Costa Rica. How will you use them as a lens to showcase what you've built? Are they a newcomer or are they just specifically very much relegated to one portion of the world and not familiar with the rest of it, or are they very familiar with the world and showing someone else the ropes? Lots of fantasies are structured as adventure, I suspect, and I do this because adventure stories are the easiest narrative structurally to show a lot of what you've created in terms of world building. But you don't have to do this. You don't have to write an adventure story if that's not the story you want to write. There are lots of different ways to showcase world building and make it relevant to your story and make it feel like a lived in, rich, interesting, interesting, satisfying world to explore. A book that I've been reading that does this really well is The Traitor Baru Cormorant by Seth Dickinson. This isn't a typical adventure story, it's very much like a political intrigue type of story, or at least it was in the first 60%. I'm not all the way through, so no spoilers. The character has to have an intimate understanding of the political workings of her world because it's her job and it's her task, it's her mission, her, her reason for going on. So you as the reader get a really intimate look at the politics, but the politics tie into the economics, the people, and the world itself. So you get a really, really, really complete idea of the world through that lens. And by approaching the world through an economics first lens, you understand the character's shortcomings. Like she has to learn more about the people and their culture and their history to succeed politically. That book is just so well done. It's so well crafted. And that's just one of the ways that you can sort of put your foot into the world and start to explore it from a more intimate lens beyond just the geography. That is pretty much all I have to say for today. I will see you guys for the next part of the series sometime soon, hopefully soon. I'm still, I'm still writing some of the scripts. There's a lot to cover here, but thank you so much for watching this video. I hope it was helpful. If you have anything else to add, any other world building basics that you feel are really important to you and your process, I would love to hear them, so drop them in the comments below. And yeah, that's pretty much it. Thank you so much for watching, and I will see you guys next time.